Hello, and welcome to the history of the early church. Episode 34, The Valerian Persecution. The cause for the first Roman imperial persecution was rather clear-cut. To restore divine favor, Decius ordered all his subjects, except Jews, to sacrifice to the gods of Rome. Christians who refused to comply were tortured and executed. The cause for the second imperial persecution by Valerian, however, is less easy to discern. The main rationale was still the same. Valerian wanted to appease Jupiter and the immortal gods, but unlike Decius, he did not order all his subjects to sacrifice. Rather, he issued laws specifically aimed against Christians. Also, whereas Decius issued his edict early in his reign, Valerian did not persecute Christianity until four years after his ascension to the throne. Indeed, there is even evidence that for the first four years of his principate, Valerian was actually quite well disposed towards Christians, even enlisting them in his imperial service. Thus, while we know why Valerian ultimately persecuted Christianity, the reasons for his sudden change in policy are less easy to determine. Dionysius of Alexandria, writing a little after the persecution ended, claims Valerian was extremely friendly towards Christians in the early years of his reign, and that his whole house was full of Christians serving and praying for him. This is obviously an exaggeration but no doubt contains some kernel of truth concerning Valerian's initial benevolence towards the Christians. As we'll discuss next episode, after Valerian's capture by the Persians in 260, his son Gallienus instituted a pro-Christian policy, and Dionysius did not want to offend Gallienus by directly attacking the emperor's father. Thus, the bishop of Alexandria, in his account of the persecution, shifted the blame onto one of Valerian's chief finance ministers, Fulvius Macrianus. Macrianus is described by Dionysius as the teacher and ruler of the synagogue of the Egyptian magicians. It's unclear exactly what that means, but it appears that Macrianus was a leading member of a prominent group of Egyptian priests. The Christians accused the Egyptian diviners of performing child sacrifice and mutilating the organs of children to determine the will of demons, i.e. the pagan gods. The Egyptian priests in turn claimed that the prayers and deeds of Christians hindered their ability to divine the will of said gods. On this basis, Dionysius states, Macrianus used his influence with the emperor to convince Valerian to launch a new persecution. While Macrianus no doubt played a role in getting the emperor to initiate an anti-Christian policy, it is clear that Valerian himself is ultimately to blame. The foreign invasions of the Roman Empire reached new heights in the years spanning 255 to 258. Germanic barbarians breached the Rhine frontier, attacking Gaul and penetrating even as far as Spain. The Alamanni invaded Italy itself, threatening the home province and the capital. The Gothic and Baroni raids Gregory Thaumaturgus dealt with also fall into this time. And of course, the Persian king of kings, Shapur, was attacking Rome and Syria. Rome was surrounded on all sides by enemy armies. On top of all this, the Cyprian plague continued to ravage the provinces, and the Roman economy continued its collapse. Something was clearly wrong. Eternal Rome appeared to be at an end. From the perspective of traditionally minded Romans, the Pax de Arm was well and truly gone. Valerian, like Decius, was from this traditional conservative senatorial elite. He believed wholeheartedly in the necessity of public virtue to, in securing the peace of the gods. Decius had even hired Valerian to assume the archaic office of censor, the old republican office that handled census taking, but more importantly, enforcing public morality. So, in this time of darkness for Mother Rome, 
Valerian turned with great intensity to the ancestral gods. He proclaimed on his coins his devotion to the Roman deities, more so than even Decius, and endeavored to see the public acts of traditional worship duly performed. It was in this context that Valerian launched the second empire-wide persecution of Christianity. Towards the end of July 257, while campaigning on the Rhine frontier, Valerian issued his first edict. All Christian clergy must participate in the Roman religious rites on pain of exile. Christian assemblies and cemetery visits were made a capital crime. Once again, the most prominent members of the church became the prime target, and across the empire, bishops and their clergy were arrested, tried, and exiled. Cyprian was arrested and tried before the proconsul Aspasius Paternus at Carthage. Paternus relayed to Cyprian the orders of the emperors and asked Cyprian to participate in the Roman rites. Cyprian refused, saying he knew no god but the one creator, to whom the Christians prayed to on behalf of Valerian and Gallienus. Paternus therefore ordered him exiled to the nearby town, Curibus. But before sending Cyprian away, the proconsul tried to get the bishop to inform on the whereabouts of the other Christian clergy. But Cyprian refused, saying Roman law justly forbids people to act as informants. Paternus replied that since he was making a formal inquiry, it was perfectly legal. So Cyprian replied that Christians are forbidden to offer themselves up. Like Polycarp a century earlier, Cyprian rejected the idea that martyrs should go out of their way to provoke their deaths. The proconsul, seeing Cyprian's resolve, ominously declared that he would find the other clergy. Cyprian was then led away into exile. Once again, the bishop of Carthage found himself running his church remotely via correspondence of letters. Among those with whom he exchanged messages was a group of Numidian confessors, who were exiled to work in the mines. In Egypt, a similar fate to that of Cyprian befell Dionysius of Alexandria. He and his clergy were brought before the acting prefect, Lucius Musius Aemilianus. The events played out almost identical to those in Carthage. Aemilianus asked Dionysius to worship the natural gods of Rome. Dionysius refused, saying he and his people worshipped no god but the one creator to whom the church prayed to on behalf of the emperors. Emilianus responded by saying they could worship their own god too, if he really was a god, so long as they conformed to the edict and performed the Roman rites. Dionysius refused. Angered by the bishop's obstinacy, the deputy prefect exiled Dionysius and his clergy immediately to the Libyan town of Kephra. At Kephra, despite the hostility of the local pagans, a considerable number of Christians joined Dionysius, and even some pagans converted after encountering the holy confessors. Later, the prefect had Dionysius and company move closer to Alexandria, in the rough region of Caluthium, near Lake Marriott, perhaps in anticipation of recalling the bishop later. However, the prefect never did recall Dionysius which led to accusations of cowardice after the persecution was over. The main accuser was an Egyptian bishop named Germanus, against whom Dionysius had to defend himself and set the record straight. We can plausibly infer that a similar pattern of arrest and exile befell many other Christian clergy in 257. According to later sources, Gregory Thaumaturgus and his deacon fled back into the Pontic Hills behind Neo-Caesarea, as had been done before under Decius. There is a somewhat tendentious account of Roman soldiers pursuing Gregory and his deacon up the hills before giving up. Although we don't have any direct evidence, it's not unreasonable to suspect that bishops such as Firmilian of Cappadocia and Hellenus of Tarsus also underwent exile, whether voluntary or not. Thus, the first year of the Valerian persecution passed with little to no bloodshed. 
So in the early summer of 258, steeper measures were introduced in the form of a rescript from Valerian to the Roman Senate. The pagan senators of Rome detested Christianity. They, more than anyone else, represented the conservative elite whose worldview of traditional piety and religion clashed most deeply with the faith of the church. On June 29th, 258 AD, the Church of Rome celebrated the martyrdom of Peter and Paul in a large public ceremony. The Senate could see for themselves the resiliency of this barbarian faith. They wrote to the emperor requesting he take further measures against the Christians. Valerian was in Antioch at the time, overseeing the war with Persia when the Senate's message reached him. In his response, the emperor laid down the harsher and bloodier policy they both desired. Valerian's rescript, the so-called Second Edict, stipulated that all Christian clergy were to be executed immediately. No arrest or trial. Simply hunted down like dogs and killed. Christian senators, other nobles, and equestrians were to be stripped of their status, and if they persisted in their Christian faith, executed. Such persons were viewed by the emperor and the senate as traitors to their class. Christian matrons would have their properties confiscated and exiled. Imperial freedmen were to have their property confiscated as well, and then re-enslaved to the imperial estates. Thus, the second year of the Valerian persecution began, and it would prove to be a bloody one. The persecution hit the city of Rome hard. The local elites urged daily for the persecution of Christians, and sought out any whom they could find and kill, confiscating their property in the process. The urban prefect and senator, Publius Cornelius Secularius, oversaw the enforcement of the persecution in the capital. This enforcement may have started on the same day as the public celebration of Peter and Paul's martyrdom. There is a reasonably reliable tradition which places the martyrdom of none other than Novatian in Rome on June 29, 258. The imperial authorities made no distinction between Catholic and schismatic. All who defied the emperor's law were to be punished. It wasn't long before the Catholic Bishop of Rome also attained the crown of martyrdom. Upon assuming the Bishopric of Rome in August 2nd, 257, Zeistus II had declined to continue Stephen's agitation of the baptismal controversy we discussed last episode. Cordial relations with Carthage and Alexandria had resumed. Zeistus II was killed by the urban prefect along with four of his deacons, while celebrating the liturgy in the cemetery of Calixtus on August 6, 258. Only four days later, Zeistus' archdeacon Lawrence, or Laurentius, was martyred after being slowly tortured with fire. St. Lawrence would become one of the most celebrated martyrs of the early Roman church. Cyprian found out about the rescript to the Senate and wrote to his brother Bishop Sacesis, warning him. Valerian had not only issued his rescript to the Roman Senate, but had also subsequently attached this second edict of persecution to letters directed to all the various provincial governors. The emperor's only moderation was that trials were to be held for Christian leaders in the provinces. What was happening to the Church of Rome would very soon befall Christians everywhere. It did not take long for Valerian's letter to reach Africa. On August 24th, under the new proconsul Galerius Maximus, a general massacre of Christians occurred in the city of Utica. Although the story of the Massa Candida as it has come down to us is obviously somewhat legendary, it preserves a kernel of authentic memory. It wasn't long before the proconsul sent word to have Cyprian recalled from Curibus to stand trial. As August gave way to September, Cyprian knew this was it. The proconsul was traveling to the city of Utica when he sent his agents to arrest Cyprian. But the bishop would die on his own terms. During his intern at Curibus, Cyprian had received a prophetic dream concerning his impending martyrdom, 
promising that his end would be delayed one day. Cyprian did not want to die at Utica, but rather be a witness in his home city. He wanted to be martyred in Carthage in front of all his clergy and laity. So he left Curvus and retired to his familial estate, waiting in his garden. He wrote one final letter addressed to the entire church of Carthage explaining his actions, as well as exhorting them to remember his example and follow the Lord's commandments. When the proconsul's arrival at Carthage was imminent, Cyprian revealed his hiding place, and he was arrested on September 13th. But as his prophetic dream had promised, Cyprian's life was spared one more day. The proconsul Maximus was ill, and had to stay in a nearby villa to recover until the next day. Finally, on September 14th, 258 AD, exactly 1758 years ago, the Bishop of Carthage was brought to Maximus's court. A huge crowd of locals had gathered to watch, both Christians and pagans. The trial began. The ailing proconsul made it short. He asked Cyprian to conform to the imperial law and perform the Roman rites. Cyprian refused. When Maximus warned him to take heed, Cyprian told the proconsul to do as he was instructed. After conferring with his staff, Maximus read aloud the sentence. Fascius Cyprianus was to be put to death by the sword. Cyprian uttered a prayer of thanks to God as he was led out to the execution area near the villa. As he was led out, the bishop was followed by a large crowd and attended by his clergy. Cyprian divested himself of his episcopal garments, handing them over to his deacons. He then knelt down in prayer, and his deacons fastened his blindfold for him. Cyprian then asked his deacons to give his executioner 25 pieces of gold. Finally, the executioner arrived, and Cyprian was beheaded. That night, the local church buried his relics in a cemetery. Only a few days later, the proconsul Galerius Maximus died of his illness. Cyprian was probably in his late fifties and had been the Bishop of Carthage for about ten years. It's hard to overstate the significance of Cyprian for the early African church. Bishop, author, patron, prophet, martyr. It would not be until the time of Augustine in the late fourth and early fifth centuries that such a single personality would dominate the churches of Africa and by extension, greatly influence Latin Christianity. He faced his death with maturity and conviction, bequeathing his church with a living model. His views on the episcopacy, church unity, baptism, and the relationship between the Christian and the world would define Christianity in Roman Africa, for better or for worse. Cyprian truly deserves all the honorifics and praise he still receives today, and his life and writings will always remain a compelling witness of Christian living and practice. Although I am sad to say goodbye to Cyprian, we must continue, as the Valerian persecution is not over. Over in Spain, early the following year, on Sunday, January 15, 259, the Bishop of Terraco, modern-day Tarragona, and his two deacons were arrested. Bishop Fructosus was reclining in his chamber when the local soldiers came and informed him that he and his deacons were under arrest and ordered to appear before the governor. Fructosus was more than willing to come, as were his deacons, Augurius and Eulogius, but first the bishop asked the soldiers if he could put on his sandals, to which they obliged. When they arrived, the bishop and his deacons were right away put in prison. Fructosus was calm and content. He even baptized a new believer. The Spanish bishop was more than ready to receive the crown of martyrdom. As he prayed near constantly in his cell, the local faithful came to comfort him and begged Fructosus not to forget about them when he entered the blessed state. For six days, the bishop and his deacons were imprisoned. Finally, on January 21st, 
they were brought before the governor of Hispania, Terraconensis, a man named Emilianus. The governor was a devout pagan and was infuriated by the obstinacy of Fructosus and his deacons. For the governor, to not worship the gods was to dishonor the emperors. The immortal gods of Rome are to be obeyed, feared, and adored. After becoming too frustrated with Fructosus, he turned to the deacons and implored them to reject their bishop. But Augurius and Eulogius remained steadfast. Enraged, Emilianus asked Fructosus one final question. Are you the bishop? I am, Fructosus replied. You were, the governor responded. And with that, he sentenced the three of them to be burned alive. As the martyrs were being led to the amphitheater, many Christians expectedly came to see Fructosus. But so too did many pagans, for so beloved by the people of Terraco was the bishop that he was respected by persons of both faiths. One man offered him drink, while another offered to untie his sandals. A Christian soldier asked the bishop to remember him, and Fructosus responded, facing the assembled brethren, that he must remember the entire Catholic Church, from east to west. When he was at the gate, the bishop gave one final counsel to the people before he and the deacons entered the arena. There, bound to stakes, Fructosus, Agorius, and Eulogius of Terraco were burned alive, a representation of the three youths from Daniel and the Holy Trinity. Not long after, visions were seen of the holy martyrs appearing to different people, including the governor himself and members of his household. On the other side of the empire, in Palestine, Eusebius reports that three men of Caesarea went forward to the governor's tribunal to offer themselves as martyrs. These three men were named Priscus, Malchus, and Alexander. On the 28th of March, 259, the governor of Palestine had them thrown to wild beasts. Thus they too won the crown of martyrdom. Eusebius also mentions another unnamed Marcionite woman in Caesarea who was also put to death about this time. A reminder that, once again, the imperial authorities persecuted non-Orthodox Christians as well. Back in North Africa, the spring of 259 saw the execution of even more Christians in Cyprian's home region. In late April, the reader Marianus and the deacon James, both confessors of the Decian persecution, were en route to Curta, the Roman capital of Numidia, to offer themselves as martyrs. The persecution was raging in Curta, and the furious governor was inflicting cruel and bloody tortures on both cler clergy and laity alike. Alongside them was the anonymous author of their martyrdom account. On their way to Curta, the trio encountered two exiled bishops named Agapius and Secundinus, who were being escorted by Roman soldiers for their final trial before the governor. The bishops greatly encouraged the three men and ignited a zeal for martyrdom within Marianus and James. The two confessors not only desired martyrdom, but also to give an example to the faithful. Agapius and Secundinus were later brought to Curta and imprisoned, tried, and finally executed on April 30th. Shortly thereafter, Two spiritual daughters of Agapius, Tertulla and Antonia, were also given the crown of martyrdom. Marianus, James, and the author were staying at a Christian home in a nearby suburb when a hostile pagan crowd, along with soldiers, surrounded and arrested them, along with other local Christians. The confessors were all then imprisoned at Curta and periodically released to be tortured. Many of the confessors suffered by having their limbs mangled. For his part, Marianus was hung on the rack by his thumbs, while weights were attached to his feet. After these tortures failed, he was returned to the prison where he fell asleep. Marianus then received a prophetic dream, where he saw martyrs being brought up to heaven. Cyprian even appeared to Marianus and invited him up to join him. Some days earlier, while they were being escorted to the city, James also received a heavenly dream confirming his path of martyrdom. 
Another confessor to receive a heavenly dream was an equestrian named Emelian. In his dream, his pagan brother came to him and interrogated Emelian concerning Christian beliefs about the afterlife. Specifically, if all martyrs received the exact same reward, or if some merited greater rewards in heaven. Emelian affirmed the latter, and declared it was all up to God. His brother persisted, vehemently and irritatingly, and Emelian finally affirmed that those who suffer and endure greater and longer torture will receive more glorious crowns of martyrdom. Soon the martyrs had all confessed Christ before the governor, and they were all transferred to the prison in the city of Lambesis. They were joined by a new confessor, who could have remained free, but he stepped forward and declared his religious allegiance before the magistrates, infuriating the pagans, who saw to it that he was punished. At Lambesis, the pagan officials had the laity separated from the clergy, hoping this would weaken their resolve. But they merely succeeded in making more martyrs and increasing the desire of the clerical confessors to receive the crown. During his time in the Lambesis prison, James the deacon received another dream, this time with the martyred bishop Agapius appearing to him. He would soon join Agapius in partaking of the heavenly banquet. On May 6, 259, Marianus, James, and the rest of the confessors were blindfolded and lined up by the executioner in a nearby river valley. It was there that they finally attained the crown of martyrdom. Before he died, Marianus gave a prophecy that the plague would befall the city for the shedding of innocent blood. His body was later collected by his Christian mother, who thanked God that she was counted worthy to have such a son. More martyrdoms followed in Carthage a few weeks later. A violent riot broke out among the residents of Carthage, which threatened the life of the proconsul. It is unclear if this was still Galerius Maximus or his successor. In response, the proconsul blamed the Christians and incited a violent pogrom against them. Afterwards, arrests were made, including a group of seven Christians led by Montanus and Lucius. If this was a new proconsul, then he too died shortly thereafter, and the procurator stepped in as acting governor. The seven confessors were imprisoned, and some of them even died under the awful prison conditions. Many of the confessors received dreams, including Montanus, who had a dream of heaven 